Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and this is your May garden to-do list and question and answer. So we're going to start with your May to-do list. And of course, remember, I'm coming at this from Zone 9. Your zone may be different. So go to USDA and check to see if your zone, if you're not familiar with it, um, because it's based on your area and your temperatures. Um, So some of this may be similar. Some of it may be completely off. Um, So I'm just going to get started. So everyone wants to know, can I plant tomatoes and peppers? And yes, you can. In zone nine, at least where I'm at, it has been an unusually wet and cold winter. So the rain is one thing, but it's been unusually cold. And you don't want to plant your tomatoes until nighttime temperatures hit that 50 degree mark and your soil temperatures warm up to then. And we did hit it. And then, of course, I planted, and then we had a little drop, but that's okay. Um, So your tomatoes you could plant. Peppers you could plant in May as well. They like warmer temperatures. So if you wait till later in the May, that's perfectly – the May. That's perfectly fine. Same with eggplants. But you could also plant beans. That's plants or direct sow. Swiss chard, which is year-round. You could pretty much plant. That plant doesn't even care. Corn, direct seed is easiest. You could buy a six-pack, but – You really need a lot of corn to actually pollinate each other. So it's ideal to plant by seed and to plant close together. Cucumbers, plants or seeds, okra, same thing. Melons, seed, it's a little early yet for plants. They like it really warm. Squash and watermelon, seeds, it's a little warm, cool yet for plants. So basically almost all your summer veggies you could plant right now. Of course, your uh, herbs you could plant. Remember cilantro? A lot of people want, okay, you know, I'm going to make some great salsa. I've got onions and I'm going to have some peppers and I'm going to have cilantro. Cilantro is a cool season herb. It's still cool enough in zone nine right now, so you could probably get away with it, but don't expect it to last through the summer. And of course, perennials, anything goes right now. We're past any chance of frost. It's still cool, so roots are going to take into the ground. So really, your citrus... I've been going to a lot of nurseries and just buying, even though every single year I'm like, oh, I'm not going to buy so much. Ooh, but look at that. Um, So you plant now, water it in, get the roots established before the heat comes. Check your irrigation lines. I did start running the irrigation and then, of course, this week temperatures drop down. But check it. You don't want to turn it on assuming everything's working and then realize you have a clogged line Or you don't want to turn something on and realize one of your sprinkler heads is pointing the wrong way and you're losing all that water. You could flush your lines if you have drip line, open up the ends, turn the water on. I did that. It looks like literally I have a whole bunch of piles of cocaine coming out because I have so much Joe's laughing. Um, Yeah, so much calcium carbonate in our lines. It's ridiculous. In our water, it's ridiculous. Stone fruit. Obviously, they should be setting fruit right now. There are, you know, it was a really wet year. I feel bad for the almond growers again. Last year, it was the cold. This year, it was cold and rain. Rain could have knocked some of the buds off. The bees weren't very active because it was cold. But if you do have a lot of fruit setting, you do want to thin that. I know it's hard, but it could actually snap branches and you don't want the happen that to happen and you want those fruit to develop so you don't want them touching. So go through and start pulling them off, picking them off if they are touching each other. Peach leaf curl, it's a bad year. Even if you sprayed uh, liquid copper in the fall when it was dormant, if you managed to get that in, you probably may still have even peach leaf curl on your nectarines and peaches just because it's so wet and it's a fungus. The spores are spread by water. Don't worry, it looks worse than it really is. 
most likely I'm seeing it on my fruit tree because I'm like the cobbler. I sprayed the trees at work. I didn't spray my trees at home and I had peach leaf curl. The new leaves are already coming out looking fine. The leaves that have the curl, the spores, they're going to fall off. Pick those up. Don't spray liquid copper now. If you notice a lot of defoliation, add a little bit of fish emulsion, some nitrogen, because it's going to have to put on a second flush of leaves. And that, of course, takes nitrogen. So that's it. Don't worry. Don't freak out. It looks worse than it is. Fertilize right now, especially if you have things in pots. Pots always need fertilizer in the ground. If you add compost, if you have chicken manure, generally things don't need tons of fertilizer in the ground, especially if you do those. But if you have pots, go ahead and fertilize. Transplant succulents. Now's the time. They're warming up. They're growing. You don't want to do that when they're wet. So now's the time to transplant succulents. And of course, monitor for pests and prep for them and be prepared. Your hose blast is your best friend. If you normally have white flies, go ahead and start looking under the leaves. If you've planted squash for those small flat white discs, those are the eggs. Blast them off. You don't want to wait until you actually see the white flies. You can lay down some reflective um, foil underneath your tomatoes and your squash for white flies. Hang yellow sticky traps. You could even lay down kaolin clay, which is a barrier, which you don't see used in orchards a lot to prevent like fruit flies going to the fruit, but you can do that and lay down your diatomaceous earth. So just be proactive about it. I haven't actually had a problem with. Uh, spring aphids. What I did have is all the winter crops that I let to go to flower for pollinators, the brassicas, the cauliflower. I had a lot of the wax aphids, uh, the cabbage aphids just recently. I'm like, oh, that's weird. They came late. So I cut them down. But on my fava beans and my roses, absolutely no aphids because it's been so cool. So, you know, each year is different. And that's pretty exciting, actually. But remember, aphids are going to come out. They're going to dissipate. Take a hose. Look for the parasitoids. If you notice any beige, like, aphids that have been, like, swollen, look for a hole. That means there's parasites doing their thing and leave them alone. If you see ladybugs, leave them alone. So really that's what you should be doing in your garden. Mulch, of course, you want to keep the moisture in, you want to smother the weeds. And if you use compost as a mulch, that's going to add some nutrients to it. And so really it's, it's, we're in the full swing of spring and it's looking great. And those are some of your to-do lists. Joe, what do you have to say about that? I was thinking, what is that giant radish that you planted? I don't think it was last year, but the year before. Starts with an R? No, D. Dacon. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're thinking about? Yeah. You yeah. didn't plant any of those. No, I didn't. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't think you mentioned radishes at all. I know I did. Back did in, you? Back in winter. It's a cool season crop. Huh. Yeah. I mean, the, how cool it's been. You could probably actually plant some radish seeds and probably get some uh, crops of small radishes because it's been so cool and they grow so quick, but it's really not the radish season time. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I didn't get radishes at all this winter. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. I'll rem remedy that. Um, as usual, I'm planting a garden and um, I'm, I say, oh, I'm not going to plant as much as I normally do. I know. Um, because this year I'm not I'm going to be gone a good portion, not a good portion of the summer, but I have some, uh, I have an adventure I'm planning for and I'm training for. And I, one, can't afford to have just so many things planted and, you know, rely on you to harvest. So I really didn't plant that many tomatoes. But Brad Gates of um, Boar, Wild Boar Farms, yeah, he contacted me. He's like, do you want to plant some trial tomatoes for me? Oh, so okay. um, I forgot to pick them up. I didn't forget, but I just ran out of time. So, um, but I only have a few tomatoes, but the peppers, that's the one thing that I planted, of course, more of a lot of your shishito peppers, good, good. um, Jimmy Nardello peppers. Don't um, know what that is. Okay. I've been planting it each year. You probably don't know. Did you plant any of the, you've interviewed a couple of people that like the really hot peppers. That yes. Grow them. I didn't plant any hot peppers. <sighs> Mainly because I can't tolerate the hot peppers. You no, can't. neither can I. No, they're fun to grow, but... You can always give them out to people. Yeah, 
I guess I could. I mean, that's what I do with most of the things. Anyway, so I'm 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 trying to like minimize the garden this year. Minimize. We'll see. You failed to mention that you're trying to take me along on your adventure for a bit. So I won't even be around to help. Yeah, good point. Well, it should be. Once everything's established and you have irrigation going, it's fine. You do need someone to go and pick everything. Um, but yeah. Um Right. Yeah, we'll see what this, you know, last year we had hardly any rain. We had really interesting bug issues. This year, tons of rain. It's been cooler. It's raining right now. Um, tomatoes are looking great. Everything's looking good. So, yeah, we'll 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 see how the year turns out. That's why gardening's great. You never know. It's like rolling the dice, but you don't possibly win lots of money at the end. Just a lot of tomatoes. No new containers this year. No. No, I haven't had you do anything in the garden. Notice nothing. Nothing in the garden. Nothing. I am such a great wife. I'm like, you go do your thing. I don't need you. What do I do? You're trying to fix the truck. All right. Should we ask, um, answer some questions? Um, sure. Okay. Okay. You ready? Yep. All right. First one from Sherry with an E at the end. No I. Two R's. Okay. That is an interesting spelling. It is. Yeah. You have a lot of people. Most of the people mm -hmm. that write you have interesting spellings and of their Most names. of the student workers at work, as I'm writing their names, I'm like, these are interesting names. I have another way to put that probably, but yes, <laughs> okay. I agree. Okay. Yeah, go on. Lately, I've been noticing hummingbird moths. You're going to have to tell me what those are. Mm -hmm. What are plants you can plant now to attract them? Okay. So hummingbird moths, they're moths, so they're in the order of what, Joe? Go back go back to your college entomology. Boy, that's oh, a rough one. Okay. All right. I'll just give it to you. Butterflies, moths, the order is Leptodoptera. Yeah, that was not my thing. Yeah, okay. Um, so they are truly moths. Very related to butterflies, number two pollinators in the world. So they have a proboscis and they suck a nectar, just like butterflies. Um, they're called hummingbird moths. I mean, that's the common name um, because they look, the size is can actually relate to a hummingbird. They flap their wings. They hover where butterflies and moths need a landing pad. Hummingbird moths do not. And a lot of them are active during the day, whereas most moths are um, nocturnal. And that's why they're attracted to white flowers that are fragrant because of nighttime. But hummingbird moths are very similar to butterflies. And in fact, I didn't know this until like a while ago that in Africa, there are no hovering uh, birds. It's only an American thing where there's hovering birds. So in Africa, where a lot of flowers you assume would be pollinated by like hummingbirds are actually pollinated by hummingbird moths. Hmm. So I did not know that. But all the aloes, hummingbird moths. Um, so yeah, during the day you may see one. You're like, oh, look at that strange hummingbird. Nope, that is not. And it's actually a moth. So there's only four species in North America of hummingbird moths and they could easily be confused with sphinx moths. And people know sphinx moths because they're large moths. And most of them that you see have pink on them. And most people know them because the larvae is the tomato hornworm. And the tomato hornworm is known to be a large larvae worm, caterpillar, that eats your tomatoes. But if you let it go and pupate, it forms into this beautiful moth. Um, and uh, so it's hard to say. I'm assuming, you know, hummingbird moth, people may use those interchangeably, hummingbird and sphinx moth. But the idea is what you could plant now is think whatever hummingbird likes, a hummingbird moth is going to like. And what I mean by that is they're after nectar, not pollen. So nectar is usually the shape of the flower denotes whether it's going to be a pollen or a nectar um, sort of a flower. And so if you have a tubular flower, it's going to be nectar almost always. And they don't need a landing pad, but if they er, there is a landing pad, that's fine as well. So think tubular flowers. Now, hummingbirds generally prefer the red color. So that's you're like, oh, hummingbirds love pink and red. Yes. 
They'll go to those colors first, but that's not the only color they'll go to. Hummingbirds will then go to different gradients of color, but they prefer the reds. But hummingbird moths, you know, I've seen them on the Margarita Bop Penstemon, which is a purple color, but it's still tubular. So think tubular flowers, Monarda, Bee Balm, Verbenas, even though you're like, well, wait a minute, that... That's strange. Those are individual flowers that are tubular. So verbena and lantana. Uh, Datura, which is a large white flower. Um, four o'clock, mirabilis. So anything that's tubular, colorful, they'll go to them. Now, that's what they eat. The larvae, however, is different. I mentioned the sphinx moth, which you know, the larvae is feeding off of your tomatoes. The hummingbird moths like honeysuckle and things in the rose family, um, like prunus and cherries. So if you happen to see certain caterpillars on plants, make sure you get the ID correct because you don't want to pick them off and kill them or use BT, which is bacillus, which kills larvae. So not all caterpillars are bad. Even if they're chewing things, you may want to let them um, eat and snack and definitely ID them before you decide to kill them. Almost always a plant that's attacked by a caterpillar can survive it. Like um, I'm thinking about at work, like we have the, uh, well, there's like the pipe vine swallowtail, which is the Aristolochia californica. It's California pipe vine. The swallowtail, a native butterfly, the larvae chews on that. It almost completely defoliates it. The plant's like, I don't care. We're not going to spray BT and kill that. Um, so usually plants overcome that as well. But so for the hummingbird moth, thinks whatever hummingbirds like. Tubular, red at first, and then various colors. Yeah. I did confirm no hummingbirds in uh, Africa, only North America. Yeah, thank you, Joe, for that. Actually, no, I think South America too. I think yeah, it's Western the Americas. Hemisphere. It's the Americas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Europe, Thanks. none. Yeah. So actually- they um have a bird in Africa and Europe that is similar to the hummingbird called uh, the sunbird. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that that's why aloe stems, flower stems are so thick compared to the flowers is the birds hold on to it and then, so the stalk has to be fairly large and compared to the flowers and then gets the nectar from it. And did you know that Darwin hypothesized- <sighs> that the Angraecum orchid was pollinated by a sphinx moth before he even saw the sphinx moth. And it turns out it's true. The sphinx moth has one of the largest proboscis. And then they found the moth afterwards. And they're like, wow. So it's truly this nectar spur of this orchid was identical to the length of the proboscis of the sphinx moth. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Say that first one again. And Graycomb? Yeah, the thing you said, did I know aloe? The aloe, aloe flowers? Mm -hmm. The stalk of the aloe flower okay. is is thicker. Okay. Much thicker than you would think that the flowers needed for support because the the birds land and hold on to the stalk of the flower to get to the flowers because they don't hover. They hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And so they don't bend it and break it. I potentially have conflict with one word in there. Okay, what is that? Because. Because. Okay, why? Why? You're saying and assuming. Yeah. That the bird. Yeah. No, you're saying and assuming that the plant uh -huh. evolved. Evolved. To the bird. Ooh, not with the bird. No, or not the other way around. Wouldn't One they? of them had to evolve yeah. preferentially yeah. for survival, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And have offspring that was more successful uh -huh. due to these changes in adaptations, either in behavior or something from a morphological standpoint, right? Yes. Okay. You're assuming that it was the plant that changed. Yeah, and I shouldn't because plants stand their ground. What? <laughs> Plan ain't going to change for a bird. Uh, okay. <laughs> Moving on. 
Just saying, you might need to look into that one and okay. see. Okay, yeah. we'll look into it. Mm-hmm. Probably not a way to know. No, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to see changes. I mean, don't you think evolution historical ha- changes over time to see if there were changes? You know, I mean, I, don't you think evolution had to happen relatively concurrently on that? No. 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 Okay. What if one of them already had m- multiple other avenues? For success. Okay. And, and one the, of them didn't. So one of them had the change. Okay. And it had an, an outweighing factor upon its reproductive success. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. My camellia tree bush <laughs> blooms pretty pink camellias every spring in the front yard. And then it proceeds to drop them all on the ground. Also, there are some brown edges on the flowers. Help, Mark. Okay, so camellias, yes, love camellias. Sadly, um, Sacramento, which is only like 30 minutes from us, you could grow great camellias because they like more acidic conditions and Sacramento has river water. They tend to have a sandy loam soil in the central parts of Sacramento because of the river. But where we're at, we have a well water and very high alkaline water, and our water comes from a well, and our soils are pretty, pretty harsh with calcium carbonate. Um, so people can grow camellias, just not as well. Um, okay, so proceed to drop them all on the ground. Yeah, so, you know, they're beautiful late winter, early spring, and they just grow, and they look beautiful, and all of a sudden, you just see more camellias on the ground than you do on the bush. They do fall off. They're very short-lived, so it can seem like they're just dropping off on the ground. Also, sometimes it may look like the buds don't open all the way and something's happening, but that's their way of sort of thinning. So if you're like, wow, I have some some camellias and they're fully open, and then I have other ones where the buds aren't open and they're just dropping, that's because that takes energy. And the plant is putting on so much flowers that it's not fully opening all of them and it's just dropping some. So that could be completely normal. They also do brown with age and they can age pretty quick. Now, the difference is there is a fungus, uh, it's a petal blight that can affect them and prematurely cause them to brown and drop. So what you want to look for is if one opens up and all of a sudden it turns brown and that brown enters towards the center quickly. We're talking about over a day. And then it drops down. And then it has a petal blight. That's called a petal blight. And sadly, there's no real great cure for it. It's preventative, meaning once those flowers fall onto the ground, pick them up. Once the leaves fall onto the ground, pick them up. And they even recommend that you do lay a mulch down on top of the soil because that will sort of smother the spores that have fallen on the ground from going back up into the plant. Um, Of course, like with any mulch, don't put it right up against the woody trunk. So yes, you will see camellia flowers as they grow and as they age, they will turn brown and they'll fall off. But if you have a flower opening up and within a day, the center turns brown and it falls off and you could almost see the venation is more brown than the surrounding part, then you do have a petal blight. And so you do want to make sure sanitation is the main way of preventing that. And of course, a wetter year, it's going to be more problematic. So if you're seeing it this year more so, that's pretty common. Next year, we may not get as much rain, probably won't get as much rain, and you may not have it as much, but do pick everything up. But um, but yeah, camellias are notorious for just falling on the ground and you're like, wow, why are they all dropping off? It's it's they're either thinning themselves or that's just what happens. They they tend to fall off. Is that your full camellia update? That's my full camellia update. I love them. I don't grow them. I love them. Well, I shouldn't say that. I grow them at work. And they're really easy to grow at work because we use DI water. So we we have very acidic water at work. I don't grow my home. This is from Karen. I inherited this bird of paradise plant when my mother passed away five years ago. It is still in the original pot. I would like to separate it and put it in a couple of different pots. Is that possible? And what tips do you have? Yeah, it's completely possible, um, especially now that it's not very hot. So remember, with any plant, you don't really want to mess with it when... 
uh, June comes because you want it to be established before the heat comes because you want the roots to get established to pick up the moisture else it's stressed. And at the same time, it's trying to pick up water and doesn't have the root system to do that. So Bird of Paradise, even though they look very tropical or not, they handle zone nine cold, freezing temperatures. Uh, most people plant them in too much shade and that's why they don't bloom. They handle a- afternoon sun pretty well. I just don't recommend putting it right up against a west wall, that reflective heat. Um, the one that work right now we have, it's in full bloom. It's in full afternoon sun, but it doesn't have any reflective heat. So you can, you could definitely divide them. So you're going to want to, you know, take it out of its pot. However, you have to do that. If you have to break the pot, break the pot. And the easiest thing to do would be to separate it by hand if possible. You could almost see where the um, individual plantlets want to separate. If that's not possible, take a serrated knife and just start cutting through. And the plant will sort of divide itself and then put it in a, you know, a succulent mix and water it in and then just let it be. I wouldn't put it in full, full afternoon sun right away. I would just let it adapt and then move it into the sun. But do it now. Don't do it. Um, I, I would say no later than, you know, end of May because you want it to be established. But don't use, remember, don't use B1 because that's just a myth. You just want to water it in and let it go. So some of the leaves are going to die off most likely. So never worry about that. If some of the leaves fall off and die, that's because it doesn't have the root system to support those um, leaves. But leave it be, even if they look bad, because if they're still green, they're still photosynthesizing, helping it um, store energy. I don't have any questions on that one. Great. Okay. You know what? I have any questions most of the time on flower ones. There's a lot of flower ones. Uh, yeah. Joe, if it's an angiosperm, it has flowers. We haven't had any. What are you talking about? No, I know. But the first one. Hummingbird moth, that's all about flowers. No, it she was about the what, hummingbird moth. It was about what plants can you grow to attract them. My question was about the hummingbird oh, moth. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So you don't like flowers? Well, I don't have as many questions about okay. them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All I don't right. know why. That's fine. Okay. I have half wine barrels that unfortunately got saturated by the rain as the water did not drain. I'm going to drill holes in the barrels, but my question is, can I reuse any of the soil by just adding new soil? Um, yeah, so I'm surprised because even r- wine barrels, well, okay, so a brand new wine barrel, it's going to be pretty snug. What happens to wine barrels with age is the banding around them gets weaker and weaker because during the summer, the wood shrinks. And you have those gaps. And then the winter, the wood swells. So I remember when I worked at the Winchester Mystery House and we had wine barrels and Del Mar, my boss, told me when you water this fully in, one, make sure you water so there's no air bubbles coming up from the soil. So you know the soil is fully saturated. And he also told me, wet the pot because you're wetting the wood and you're causing it to swell. So the water, so that's always stuck in my head. But wine barrels, they have, you know, a finite amount of time before the wood just degrades. What? Finite. I use that word. Don't laugh at me. No, I'm not laughing at you. Okay. What? How old can wine barrels be if used as a proper wine barrel? Probably no more than 10 years before they start falling apart. Did you just make that up? Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, the wood disintegrates. But then the banding, because it shrinks and swells so much. Yeah, but if it's full of wine, it doesn't. Oh, wine, because it constantly has the same moisture. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying if it's used oh, as I a wine you, barrel. Oh, I thought a wine barrel. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Wine doesn't last that long in my house. Well, no, 10 minutes in that goddamn thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how would I know how long a wine barrel? I'd be like, oh, a wine barrel full of wine lasts a week, right? Yeah, no, I thought you meant, okay, I thought we we're talking about plants. So yeah, no, it shrinks and swells. So if you have a wine barrel, make sure you water the wood and the pot during the summer so it swells. So this must be a new one, or it was so wet this year that the wood was constantly swollen that it didn't even drain. Um, so the problem with standing water is it's anaerobic. Anaerobic means there's no oxygen. Roots need oxygen. So you know you have anaerobic soil when you dig into it and it has that sulfur smell. Um, that's not good. Um, another possibility is, you know, it's so much water is 
just leaching out all the nutrients. So yes, you could reuse the soil for sure. But if you're trying to mix in new soil with it and it's still really wet and smelly, I would not. But let it dry out. Go ahead and add new soil to it. Um, But if it's, you know, if it was uh, like if you dug it out from the garden and put it in there and it's clay soil, forget it, get rid of it. But but no, as long as you're replenishing it with new nutrients and compost and new potting soil is going to have nutrients, it's okay. And once it starts drying out and you mix it in, there's going to be more air pockets into it. So I would say the rule of thumb is get rid of half of it and add 50 percent more. That's my go to when I've done that before is I'm like, I don't like all the soil but I don't want to replenish all of it, get rid of 50%, add 50% more, mix it all in, and you're good to go. But yeah, definitely drain holes in a wine barrel. They don't come with that. And remember, you have to have a you have to have a drain hole some somehow else you're gonna run into way, big problems. How big of a hole? Um, so it depends on you could do a whole bunch of um small ones all around the base of it, or you could do three half inch holes. Half inch, not that big. Ah, oh, jeez, Joe, you're making me do measurements again. <sighs> half inch, half inch. That is not half inch. Uh, thumbnail, thumbnail size. Joe, thumbnail. What's my thumbnail? Uh, that, that seems not very large. Three me. quarter inch, three quarter inch, three quarter inch. Uh, but you know what? No, half wine barrel. No, you know what I would do for a half wine barrel? Now I'm thinking about it. I would do at least eight three quarter inch holes. All around. Yeah. Yeah. Seems better. But I know you're going to lose water from the sides too because it's not. Mm -hmm. So for a wine barrel, you're going to lose water. But yeah, eight three quarter inch holes. Drill through it. Yeah. So yeah. All right. Um, Is that it? That's it. Okay. Any last words of wisdom? No, not of wisdom. Are you thinking about the wine barrel? No, I was thinking about how we we caught the mass murderer that was in Davis this week. Well, not we. Let's not... (laughs) We caught him? I said, let's not go and say we. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for those that don't know, I live, in, I work in Davis. We live in winters, but there was a uh, serial killer and uh, work was being affected. Labs, night labs were closed and, um, but no, they caught him today. And most likely he came in through the conservatory um, during one of the labs because he was a bio major. So yeah, it's just a side note. I listened to a lot of true crime and- uh, Luckily, true crime didn't totally find me, but I mean, that wasn't murder, Joe. No. You know what, though? What? Um, you of uh, the three people yeah. that postulated where yeah, he came from, I you know. were the one that said, no, I'm definitely not a student. Okay. I'm, I, I feel bad. Yeah. I mean, as much murder I listen to, yeah. I should know a murderer more than anyone else. And everyone was saying, oh, he's a student. He's a student. I said, no way he's a student. Technically, I win because he got kicked out of school on the 25th and started killing afterwards. But yeah, he was a student. Um, Yeah. It was very sad. A little scary. Not too scary. I mean, statistics wise, but you know, we definitely didn't want to be out at nighttime. So anyways, that's a strange side note. Um, So if you have a question, a comment, Make sure you email me at MarleneThePlantLady at gmail.com and follow me on Instagram, Marlene the Plant Lady, Facebook, Marlene the Plant Lady, and YouTube, Everything Gardening. And if you like this, uh, write a review, a five star on Spotify or on Apple. Was it Apple Podcasts? Is it iTunes podcast? I don't even know what they call it anymore. Not sure what they call it, but I don't it's know the Apple. Call. Yeah, it's the Apple. The Apple podcast. <laughs> it's the Apple podcasts because uh, that's how we move up the ranks. And uh, until next time, everyone, happy gardening.